If you're here, that means you've watched part one and are eagerly waiting for part two. But in case you haven't, part one is out already. Make sure you head over and watch it first. Without further delay, here is part two. Absolutely. And and can you, you know, what what was the the surgical process itself like? What what specifically was going on on that day? You know, mm-hmm. you know, it's for most of us on days of surgery, we're nervous simply because it's it's nerve wracking to be under anesthesia. And for you, it's a little different because you had a seven hour reconstructive surgery. So yeah. What was that like? What what was that day like? So I so yeah, you, exactly right. It was the seven hour procedure. Um and in that surgery, what they basically did was like looking back at the notes, kind of what ha- what they did while I was under was there were two surgeons. So there was Dr. Roth and then there was another surgeon. Um and he, and so the other surgeon, he was the one that specifically focused on getting the the tissue, like getting the graft from the abdomen lining. So he went in laparoscopically, like around my belly button, like there's five incisions and I have scars there. Um, they went in laparoscopically, took out, um, it's called the peritoneum and it's the, the lining of the inner abdomen. So they went and took a graft of that, of that tissue. And then that was when Dr. Roth came in to the picture of the surgery and he basically did the actual vaginoplasty part. So basically, and a vaginoplasty in this case is actually just a combination of a lot of procedures. Like, for example, like removing the testicles is called like an orchiectomy. So they perform that and then they remove the testicles and basically reconfigure everything. They have to remove the penile tissue then they went and created like an opening in my pelvic floor um had to create like an like an exterior opening to it then that was where so it would connect to the new tissue that was inside and using that graft to create the organ but then they created the external part so they used my like i don't even know what that tissue is called but like basically the tip of the penis is what's used to create the clitoris so they use that and then I believe they use some of the scrotal tissue on the outside. Um, And so, yeah, it's basically a full reconstruction of your entire pelvic floor. Mm -hmm. And so that was what happened during the surgery. And they, and then like once that's done, they place something called a stent inside in order just to keep, keep it open. And I woke up and I didn't, I just felt like, I was hit by a bus. Like, I mean, I think also just being under anesthesia for seven hours, you're going to feel that way. Um, But I actually didn't feel much at all. I felt like a lot of stiffness in my body, but I had an epidural in. So Mm -hmm. I didn't actually feel anything from the waist down. Um, It wasn't until about maybe like two days after the surgery when they weaned the epidural off because they were going to take the stint out. And... That was one of the most painful things I've ever experienced Um, because he basically told me like I was going to have to push a little bit and then he would remove it. And so it was almost like a mini birth sort of thing of like pushing something out. Um, And it definitely felt like it definitely was a lot of pain. And I was on a lot of pain medication. I was bleeding a lot. I was really constipated. I wasn't going to the bathroom at all. Like, I don't think I went for like a week. Wow. Um, And then I also had a catheter in. So I was going, I was urinating in a bag. Um, And I also couldn't really walk very much either. Like just so much happens in your pelvic floor. And to walk, like I would stand up and immediately lightheaded and I I passed out. Like almost every single time. And around this time... Go ahead. So it took me took me about like two weeks till I was walking without passing out. And within this within this two week time frame that you're mentioning right now, mm-hmm. I remember you know from the interviews that you've done, you've talked a lot about the interesting behavior from the hospital staff after the the surgery, and 
the way that they acted when you were basically trying to heal. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that behavior and, and almost the poking and prodding from the hospital staff after you finished having the procedure? Yeah. Um, and that's, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's something I've kind of talked about and something that my family and I experienced while I was in there was there was a really big fascination with what was happening and a really big interest because I was the youngest person they'd ever seen to do this. I mean, to have the surgery in this hospital and that technique as well. Like a nurse came and told me that she was like, you're the youngest person that's been in here to do this. Like I've, I've never even seen it. Um, most of us haven't even seen this procedure done here. And it was every, like, it just felt like, I don't even know the right word. It felt like such a medical, like milestone. I think mm -hmm. it felt like a really big milestone for them to, to witness something like this and for the hospital to have somebody this young doing it. It felt like a really big deal. I was made to feel like really special and that it was a really amazing thing. And everybody was so fascinated with it. And Dr. Roth brought in a lot of different people. Other doctors would come in. He brought in other residents, people to look, um, and it's hard because I know that they do that with other procedures and stuff, but especially something like this, it was really hard because I mean, this is my genitals and he was bringing in so many people to look at him. People were like, just so celebratory of something when I was going through so much pain. Absolutely. And it was, it was very, it made it, it made it feel like it was a science class. And I've said that before, but it did feel like that at times. Like I was, like he was bringing people in to like look at what, like what he had accomplished. Mm -hmm. And yeah. in reality, like it was not going right. It was not going right at all. Um, But I just wasn't even fully aware that things weren't going right. I thought that this was just complications Mm -hmm. that yeah. are just normal, but it goes away and that you're still on track of everything. It's just obviously things happen and so you'll be fine. But yeah, and I'm glad that you mentioned the word complication because I wanted to ask you, you've talked about, you know, of course, the the pain after the surgery and, you know, you couldn't you couldn't uh, use the bathroom for a week. You couldn't there are certain things that you weren't able to do for a lot of surgeries. Mm -hmm. That's just natural. Yeah. At what point and in terms of the recovery process, at one at what point did you begin to surpass, oh, this is just pain because I just had a big surgery to, oh no, I think I have a complication from the surgery. When did yeah. that happen? So definitely the first thing that kind of, and this wasn't even the moment where I was like, okay, this is taking like a severe turn, but I mean, I, it really was though. Um, mm -hmm was it was a couple days after the surgery and the reason why because typically they only have people for that kind of surgery in the hospital three to four days that you're like an inpatient for me i was there two weeks because i developed a dvt so that's basically a deep vein thrombosis so a large clots in the legs and those can become a pulmonary embolism if they get to the heart okay and that's cardiac arrest mm -hmm. and they had found it because I had a low grade fever. And so from there I had to be on like a heparin drip, which is basically like an IV drip of blood thinners. And then for three months after that, I had to give myself injections of, of a blood thinner um, twice a day. And that was like one of the first things that kind of happened where it was like, oh, that's like a pretty severe complication. Um, I hadn't heard of that happening to many people. I knew blood clotting is always a risk, but I didn't, I hadn't heard of a lot of people having to be on a heparin drip or anything like this after this kind of surgery. Um, so that was, that was a big major complication, but I didn't think that it would affect the actual surgery itself. It just seemed like that's something that kind of arose, but once you treat that, it goes away. It felt almost more independent of like the actual, like my pelvic floor and like my genitals and everything there. It's right. like, oh, this kind of popped up, but we'll treat it and then just, then you'll recover and it's fine. So I think that's why I didn't recognize that as being like, oh, this is like a severe problem because it was kind of independent of, even though it was caused by having surgery, it wasn't like an issue in that area itself. But I would say that that point came about 
three months after because the way that it's supposed to work. So when you go home, you have to dilate. And I've talked about this before, but basically dilating is you use like a plastic, like toy, essentially. It's like a plastic smooth dildo, essentially. Um, And you have four sizes that are given to you and you have to start with the smallest one. And then you need to progress. I think by the end of like, a, there's like a certain time frame they want you to, to be on. And so at the end of, I believe by the end of a certain amount of time, you need to be on the biggest size that they give you. Um, that'll ensure that you have enough space, enough depth, and then also that you'll be able to actually use it um, right. in a sexual way. And I was not able to progress up with dilating. That was when it was dilating that it really became clear that there were some really big problems because I started off right away on the second dilator out of the four and I was using it and it was going okay like for a while like for about a month month and a half it was fine but it was I was never able to go up to the third never not once was I able to even get it in like at all I maybe a little bit but then it just it was it just did not fit right and I was stuck on the second size but it was just becoming so painful. Like it was still so, it started off like a numb feeling, but then it became painful. And that was the opposite of what I told, wh- what I was told would happen and that it becomes easier every single week and every single time you do it. Mm-hmm. And it becomes so normal that you just put it in and it's like, mm, just kind of sit around and watch something until I'm done. But it was becoming more and more painful every single week. Um, and it almost, and it felt like I was like, it it was like, it felt like it was just, even though I was dilating, trying to keep it open, it felt like it was closing and it still felt like, I was like, why is it still like, it feels like it's getting even harder. Yeah. And I talked to Dr. Roth about it and he said, oh, we'll try using a pillow underneath your lower back to try and do maybe it's the angle um that can maybe have an issue of why it doesn't like it maybe doesn't feel like it's in there properly so maybe try going in from a different angle um and he also suggested I do pelvic floor therapy but I went to pelvic floor therapy and all they did was like have me try different angles and kind of talk to me about breathing when I do it it wasn't I don't know I don't feel like it really served served to benefit me in terms of dilating sounds like a whole lot of bullshit yeah like it just didn't feel like what i was doing there was going to help me dilate better um and so i tried using the pillow and stuff and i mean it kind of did make it a little bit easier to insert but time went on i was still bleeding a lot the pain dilating was getting worse and it was just getting worse over months And I was practically like forcing it inside of myself. And it felt like I was shredding like the inside of my body every single time I did it. Because, and I knew, and I didn't know this at the time, but I know now more because I finally found somebody else that like, she's much older than me, but she's had this surgery. And I've watched a video of hers talking about this tissue and that using the peritoneal tissue, one of the issues with it is that it's very sticky and it's prone to fusing back to itself, especially because using it in a graft like this, it's surrounded by itself. Right. So it's so prone to sticking and going <clears throat> and fusing back together. And it has a high propensity to heal. Like, I mean, any of the procedures do, and that's why you have to dilate, but especially this kind of tissue, it like, since it's all next to each other and it's already sticky, it's prone to something called webbing and it wants to web back together. And that's what was happening was no matter what, no matter how much I was dilating, it was still webbing together. And so every time I was dilating, the more and more time went on, I was basically ripping it back open more or trying to. And that's why the pain was getting worse and why I was bleeding more. Because after, like, in the beginning, like, after, like, the first month or so, I wasn't bleeding as much. But then the bleeding started up again a few months later. And it started to get worse and worse every time I dilated. And it got to the point where I actually had to go down 
to the first one. And that was really scary to me because I was like, why is it that I'm going down in size? And so one of the follow-up appointments I had was about three months after the surgery. And I was telling Dr. Roth, I'm just like, I'm not able to go up anymore. Like the pain is still there. I'm still bleeding. Like I'm not able to go up with the dilator. I don't, I also, there's also dots on the dilator. Um, so you can see how, like the depth of how far it's going. Uh-huh. And I would use my finger. And so I would use my finger to kind of hold on the dot where it was, like when I got it in all the way to see like how far, like how much depth I had internally. And it was going down. Mm-hmm. Like I was significantly losing it. And he, in that three months appointment, I told him, I was like, I think the depth is going down and stuff. And he used and he and I, and so he pulled out one of the dilators because I brought them. And he was like, okay, where are you able to get all the way in with the dilator? And I showed him, I was like, in the beginning it was here and now it's down to here. And he said, well, I think you can still have sex with that. And so it was already right away kind of dismissing the idea that something wrong was happening. He basically was telling me, no, you're still doing fine. You're on track. You're just losing depths. And that happens, but you can still have sex. Um, wow. And he wanted me, and he told me he was like, try and use it in like a sexual way. Like use it almost to like masturbate. Um, he was saying like, try to orgasm. Like from dilating or try even like just trying to stimulate yourself while you do it. That can help. And it just wasn't even like fathomable. Because how are you supposed to do that? And everything is still so... Oh, another complication I had, I forgot to mention, was I had something called a labial hematoma. So basically, a hematoma is like a collection of blood. And that happened in one of the labias they made. And like of the of the, the genitals. And so it was on the left labia. And so that entire area, the left side was just super swollen. And that was for a few months until it drained. And so everything was just so raw and reconstructed there. There was no way for me to even try and use it in a sexual way because everything was so raw and still healing. I'm not like nothing about it felt sexual or pleasurable. Right. And let alone trying to use the dilator or even trying to stimulate myself. So I'm sorry, I kind of lost my train of thought there. But go ahead. Yeah, so he had kind of told me those things during the appointment. And so I was like, okay, I guess maybe I can just keep trying. Um, Maybe try using that size that I'm able to do and then slowly kind of putting in the next one to try and just get myself there. It was not happening. I was losing so much depth after that. Like, I mean, it was, I was maybe able to get the dilator in like the second one about like that much. Wow. And so then that was when I had to go down to the first one because I was like, more than anything, I just don't want to lose depth. So even if I have to go down in size, like I would rather just do that. So at least I'm able to get it all the way in. Of course. And then from there, I can try and build up the the actual like size of the dilator again. But right. So I was going backwards, but even then, like after a while, even the first one started to hurt and it started to become really painful. And I would call Dr. Roth and I called him, maybe this was, I would say probably around five or six months. I was like, I I tried getting a hold of him and I was like, this is still getting worse. Like I was like the pain of dilating had gotten so bad that I would cry every single time and I would bleed so much and I would actually call my mom when I was doing it because I was just so emotional and I just needed someone to talk to because I was in so much pain and I was already six months into like past the surgery and the pain is at like an all time high with dilating. And I was just terrified. I was like, I don't know even what's happening to my body right now. Like, I don't know what's going on because this entire recovery has gone backwards and I have no idea what is going on or what, like, what this is going to look like, what the end result's going to be. And so I tried to get a hold of Dr. Roth. And I told him kind of what was going on. And he said, 
well, I'm going to put you on antibiotics because it could be an infection um, that's causing swelling there. And so I did antibiotics for two weeks that did nothing, nothing at all. The pain was because it wasn't an infection that was doing that. It was because of like what I talked to you about, like the nature of that tissue, it was closing. Right. And I was ripping it back open every time. And so that's why. So basically I was developing scar tissue from that. So because that tissue was webbing and sticking back together and I was reopening it with the dilator and bleeding, causing so much pain. So it was turning into scar tissue. And so that's why the, that's why the pain was getting worse too. Um, But I didn't know that at the time. So this just kept going on and on. Like it was down to the point where even on the first dilator, I was barely able to get it in. Wow. And so that was when I called Dr. Roth and I was like, I need, I need to come in. Cause at that point when he put me on antibiotics, I didn't see him. I didn't see Dr. Roth again after that three month appointment for a while up until the end of that year. And that was about nine months. And I had finally told him like the, the antibiotics did nothing. I'm down to the first dilator. I can barely even get it in. I'm in so much pain every time, every time I try and do it, like something is severely wrong here. Cause how am I almost at nine months? I'm almost like three months away from a year. Right. This is where I'm at. Like, I don't know what's happening. And he had me come in and he did something called a vaginoscopy. So it's basically like a colonoscopy, just the vagina. Um, and he went in with a camera and looked at it and it was scar tissue inside of it. Um, and it was, he said it was like pretty much closed up. Um, it's extremely narrow, lost like almost all the depths. It's just scar tissue inside. Um, and so he said, it's going to close up no matter what. Um, and so he told me you can stop dilating cause there's really just no, there's just no way it's going to recover. And like my entire world was crushed in that moment. I remember just sitting there and I was so broken because I had put myself through so much. Like this took me out like almost an entire year. Right. And I, my life derailed because of it, because I put everything on hold to do this. And it felt like everything I had been through, all of this transition, I sat there and I was like, and this is where I'm at. I went through all of this. I went through so much pain. I, I subjected myself to so much bullying, so much, embarrassment i put my family through so much and all for this moment to just crumble and like i just i just had a full like i just sobbed and i cried in that room and he walked out and he said that i'll give you a minute And when he came back in, he told me that they can do a second surgery. He was like, yeah, so we'll need to do a second revision. um, And we'll have to use the colon graft to do it um, because I don't have any penile tissue to use. So my only option is to do like a sigmoid colon graft. And he sent me, he, he basically referred me to a colorectal specialist that would do the graft procedure. Like how the first, like how there was another surgeon that did the graft. There's going to be another one for the second procedure that would do the colon graft. Of course. And I met with this surgeon and he looked at my MRIs and all my scans and imaging I had done. And he said, you, your entire pelvic floor is traumatized. Um, it is pretty much collapsed. And on itself, you have scar tissue internally. There is no way I will operate on you. Um, it would, and that was one thing is Dr. Roth told me it would be not as intense the second one because they wouldn't be doing much externally it would just be internal but this doctor was telling me otherwise he said it would be a very intense procedure to do this to do it to completely take it all out and to do a colon graft and you would probably have even a longer hospital stay you would probably more than likely have worse complications if not if not possibly like life threatening um And I just felt so confused. I was like, I just didn't understand how 
he was telling me a very different story than what Dr. Roth was telling me about a second surgery. And so I called Dr. Roth and he referred me to another surgeon because he was like, that's not true. We can do a second procedure. And so he sent me to another doctor. The doctor said the same thing. He said, I just cannot in good conscience operate on you. He said, it's, it's just, he said, in just my professional opinion, there's so much scarring internally. And if this is what, how your body responded to the first one, it's probably going to do it with the second, with trying a new graft, your body's probably going to reject it and close it. Um, and you're going to have more than likely even worse complications than you had before. And so he was like, it just, it's not like the end result is just not worth it for you. And I just, I, I just can't operate on you and do this. And when I kind of confronted and I started to push back on Dr. Roth and I was like, what is this? Like, why is it that you've painted that the second, that a revision surgery would actually be easier when, and they're all telling me that this could, this will be even worse. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I, he kind of just had no answer. He was like, well, I mean, we can find another, I can, he was like, I can refer you. Like he was brought to refer me to probably somebody else. He was going to keep referring me until someone would do it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> he was going to keep referring you until somebody threatened your life basically. And, and basically went against their medical oath, which is, it sounds like that's what these, these doctors were trying to do is abide by their medical oath and yeah. not put you at risk. It sounds like that's what they were trying to do. Yeah. And, you know, at, at this point in, in time, yes, of course, the physical, the physical is important. You're in physical pain. It's, it's not, um, it's not something that I, I would think you would wish on your worst enemy. I'm sure the pain that you were going through, but no. what was your mental health like at this point? How, how are you coping or not coping? What was this like for you? My mental health was probably the worst it has ever been. And I mean, that's saying something, especially from where it was at when I started transitioning at all. Right. Because it didn't, it didn't take away that last bit of dysphoria that I was, that was really difficult to live with. It created a brand new one that I still live with now. Because rather than even having male functioning genitals that I just didn't, that I didn't like, um, I now have something that doesn't even look like male or female. Um, that's another really difficult part is that the external does not even, it just did not look like how it was expected to. And so having something that is completely closed and also doesn't look really fully male or female, even though it looks more female, obviously, but it's, it's still very clearly something else Yeah, is extremely dysphoric. Um, and it, it's the most severe dysphoria I've ever felt. And it's even beyond just like a gender dysphoric feeling. It's a, I questioned my humanity at the time. Like you almost questioned feeling like a human being at that point yeah. because I have something, I don't have work, any functioning genitalia anymore. And I would just look at myself and I'm like, I don't even feel like a person anymore. And I did all of this to feel like a normal person. And now I don't even feel like a person. <clears throat> And so my mental health was just at the worst it's ever been, especially after learning about what a second procedure would look like. I knew, and even though people try and tell me now, like, oh, don't, like, just hold out hope. Like, there could be other things. It's not going to be fixed. Even if some surgery popped up, the intensity that my body would go through to remove all of everything internally, remove all that scar tissue and recreate everything all over again, it's never going to happen. It is never going to be fixed without putting myself through something even worse than what I went through the first time. 
and having to like live with the with the reality that like that will never come back it will never be fixed no one in good conscience can ever fix it i i couldn't picture i was like what does even living look like after this what does being a human being look like after this because i hadn't i wasn't able to find really any anybody that actually sat and talked about what their life is like having lived with bottom surgery that went horrifically like this i had seen a few like great stories online but even like the people like because that's that's one thing is like you learn that like so many people have had the surgery like multiple revisions or multiple times or had so many different complications but i wasn't able to find anybody that sat and talked about what what this is like in detail like what it like how do you live with this how like i had heard nobody talk about this specific experience like in to detail but i knew that it was out there i knew that there had to be other people that had lived like this and so i just felt alone more than anything i felt so alone and i felt like i had to just keep this big secret because people around me didn't know that i was having this surgery I didn't want people to know. I just wanted to have the surgery and then I would go on about my regular life. I would finally be able to live a regular life. But now I have to like carry around this secret that I know I've transitioned so much that I look female to like the people in the world. But now I have this secret that I know that I don't have functioning genitals. And it was like the most dysphoric feeling I've ever felt, like even before I ever transitioned. And it just opened up so many mental health problems. I was, it just, it felt like I had gone backwards in transition almost. Well, you know, first of all, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot that needs to be said about the fact that, you know, you turned 23 yesterday. We are both very, very young. There is so many opportunities and so many things that are coming our way that we don't even know are going to come our way. Mm -hmm. There are, the future, Brianna, is so bright for you. It really is. There is, there is so, so, so many things that I see coming for you that I, I can't even explain to you how, you know, how meaningful what you're doing is. And, and how meaningful your story will be for the rest of your life. Because, you know, it's something that has caused you pain. But in pain, you know, a lot of us learn about ourselves from the, the experiences that we go through. And mm-hmm. knowing that you've come out of this so strong and the fact that you are taking it in yourself to tell this story so that other people know and other children, other adults even who choose to have these surgeries at a certain age, because it's not just about children, adults who choose to have these, these procedures. It's important for people to know this. And among many things that I see for you, you have a wonderful speaking voice. You have the ability to be such an incredible motivational speaker. There is not just not just motivational in terms of the story and how inspiring it is that you are, but just in general, you're such a delight to talk to. You've been wonderful throughout this entire conversation. And again, we're so young. There are so many more things that are coming our way. And there is so much more to life than the sexual experiences that you might have. Not only that, but I understand why you would be hesitant and not too hopeful about possible, you know, future medical procedures or future, uh, something that might help you in the future, maybe feel a little bit more like yourself. I know that you're hesitant to think about those things and hesitant to even consider them because it is something that took so much out of your life in terms of not just, you know, the surgical process itself, but as a human being, it's been, it's been a lot for you. Um, But science is only progressing. 
science is only progressing and science is only going to get better. And I'm not just saying that in the sense of, oh, you know, one day you could have a corrective surgery. I just mean it in the sense of the science, especially for trans people, is progressing every single day. And every single day, there is more studies that come out about the process of transition. And I would not be surprised if eventually something does come up that can can help you in any possible way. Again, I'm not saying directly any form of corrective surgery, because I understand why you would want to be hesitant about that. But it's not something that I would ever say never on. This isn't the end for you. It's really not. It's really not. And having this conversation with you is only proof of that because you're incredibly intelligent, incredibly intelligent. And I know that you're going to kick ass. I think it's important that you talk about this because of the fact that, like you said, a lot of people are not on record talking about the story, but a lot of people are not on record talking about the aftermath of the story and and the attempts made to possibly try and fix it. And you've already talked about the fact that they, they've, they at this point in time, now that you know that there was complications with your surgery, you basically got educated on the fact that, well, it actually happens a lot more often than you might think. A lot of people have to get corrective surgeries. Were there any legitimate attempts to correct what was going on? Any sort of uh, real path that was offered to you besides just this cannot be done what what did healing look like for something like this yeah there was nothing really laid out um it was pretty much they said we just can't do a second surgery um i didn't have any more contact with dr roth i still don't um so i have no idea like what's going on in terms of that part of my body it's still inside and that's something that like i haven't there's so much that can even happen from just that being there because one of the dangers of why, like, it's not even just about like, like dilating to keep it open, like to maintain depth. So you have depth and you have size of it, but it's, it's also because it's a huge health hazard for it to close up because it forms a bubble inside and that if it were to ever rupture, it would leak so much and it would cause, it would make you septic. Right. And it would cause a lot of of huge health problems. And I mean, I'm fully closed up. So, and I also don't have a doctor or see anybody like a Dr. Roth that specialized in that. So it's just there. Um, and there is the possibility that, that could happen at any moment. Um, and I don't have anybody that's giving me care to look at it. So no, nobody offered any, any like pathway of what to do next. Pretty much the other two surgeons, even though they were, they were kind, they just said, we just can't do a second surgery. Um, that was pretty much it. And now I'm kind of just like in a, in limbo. Um, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't, I have no idea what's going on there. All I know is that it is closed. Um, I don't feel much there. It's just kind of there. And are you are you still in pain? Do you find yourself? Do you still have issues with bleeding or discharge or? Mm-hmm. So, I don't really have any. I think because it's fully closed up, there's no there's no more bleeding from it. Thank God. Um, the only pain is really sometimes going to the bathroom. It can't like I'll feel it sometimes in that area um, because of the pressure like against it. Um, and actually touching like what the, where the opening was is really uncomfortable for me. Like it's painful, um, touch that. So there's still some discomfort, but it's not like a constant pain. Like it was before it's kind of just died down. Um, it's only really uncomfortable if I touch it. Mm Mm-hmm. And we, I, I'm asking this question now after this specific part of the conversation because it's important and you, you know why I'm asking this question. After describing all of this to me, touching on the topic that we touched on very lightly in the very beginning of the conversation, what do you say to, to parents, to their teenage children, and to that person in my comment section who said that this is reversible? 
there's nothing about a transition that's reversible. Like, even when people detransition, that's not reversing their transition. That's a just honestly a new kind of transition. Mm-hmm. There is no, none of this process that I could ever go back on, especially if you do it at a young age. Um, I mean, there are some instances where there is an argument for that, especially if you're somebody older, so you've already gone through puberty. Um, this is specifically like male to female. If you're on estrogen just for a little bit, you can go back. Like, especially if you're like a fully sexually developed adult, adult male. You can take estrogen for probably a while, but then you can go back and let testosterone kind of take back over and you'll probably, it'll, you can probably definitely go back, but that's not the, that's not the case that like we're talking about here. You know, that's what we're talking about people that, that are young in transition or majority of people that transition. We need to stop even speaking about it. Like it's reversible. None of this is reversible let alone any medical or surgical intervention that you undergo. And specifically someone even thinking that the bottom surgery is reversible. And I actually read a tweet like that, like last week, someone saying that they believed vaginoplasty was reversible. I want us all to just think a little logically here, just like a little bit, okay? Just stay with me. They removed my testicles and they were disposed. So how's that coming back? They don't go dig them up and find them and reattach it. Um, That skin was completely, like part of that also is they cut my urethra because men have a longer urethra because they have a penis, but then women, it's right at the body. So they cut it and put it at my body. So how could that be undone? Right. Like it would, there's never anything to be reversed. They would just be doing a different constructive, reconstructive procedure. They'd be reconstructing what they reconstructed. Absolutely. Into something else. So none of this is even a reverse. Even things that we think are reversible, you're just going through a different process at that point. Nothing right. can be undone. And I just caution people so much when it comes to making these changes because now, and I think people ask me a lot, like, would you ever have the the thoughts that you do or say the things that you do or speak about this if it had went well? Would you have ever regretted it if it had went well? And absolutely, because it is a lifelong commitment after that point when you have that surgery. And I didn't, and I didn't fully digest that at the point at the time. Even if that surgery had went well, you will nonstop be dilating. I didn't realize that a lot of women, like trans women that have bottom surgery and are able to have sex, I didn't realize that a lot of them have to dilate before sex in order to make it work. Wow. Like, I didn't realize that that was actually pretty common for people that have had like a satisfying result is that a lot of times it's still like a lot of work. Like they have, they have to fully lubricate themselves and then they have to dilate for a while and then they can have sex with a partner and even then like I didn't even fully understand that when I went into the procedure and already now it's now at me being 23 years old I'm actually like you know I think I could have learned to have been okay with having a penis and still looking like having a feminized body right but for so long I didn't think that and that was because like the things that I thought about my transition have even changed over time while I've transitioned and things that I maybe have been dysphoric about. I've not so much anymore. And now I'm dysphoric about other things and that, because that's part of it. Yeah. This is such a complicated mental state to be in. And I think for people to be so hell bent on advocating for people, for young people to access and have such easy access to certain really severe medical transition is just I think it's a disservice to them especially when we're already all aware that there's not much therapy required if at all for anybody that transitions I know Mm -hmm. that it was never required for me I didn't have it I only had that one 30 minute appointment and she and so fun fact is that because I don't know if you're aware but in order to have bottom surgery you have to have two letters like two people that like recommend it for you. I did not. Yeah. So that's part of called WPATH. They set the guidelines for 
getting approved to have surgery and you need to have letters. So you need to have like a, like a doctor and then you need to have like a mental health professional. Okay. That sign off. So my primary care, she was the one that gave me my hormones. She did the letter. And then it was actually that social, that clinical social worker that gave me my second letter. The only time I had ever met her was that time I was 14. Wow. But then when I was eight, I was 19 and I needed the letters, she wrote it for me. And she had only seen me that one time. Like for 30 ago. minutes. Mm-hmm. But wow. yeah, she was, she sent, she sent over the letter mm-hmm. to approve me for the surgery. So I just caution people because I don't think, I don't think that there's enough information, enough research. There's no research about long-term of even what being on hormones really looks like for trans people. There's not even really long-term major studies about what is, what's going to happen to my body when this has been in there for 10 years and just Mm -hmm. sitting there 20 years. I have no idea. I don't know what even hormones look like long-term. So, so like, I don't even tell people, like I never have given concrete people should not be transitioning like this. We should not be doing this because I understand that it's complex and it's different for everybody. My purpose here is just to paint you guys one of the most detailed pictures I think that's ever been painted of a transition to show you that there's a huge lack of research and data. So every single step of a transition you need to do with so much careful consideration of yourself, looking at the bigger picture what weighing the pros and cons of each step you're going to make in a transition before you do it. Yeah. That's something that I didn't do because I felt that sense of urgency. Like I told you. Absolutely. And that's my biggest, that's really my biggest message more than anything is that before you say yes to something that you can never go back on, just really take your time. Just really take your time. It's not worth it. Like the things that I sacrificed just because I was so afraid of not passing, not looking good to other people. I mean, I sacrificed having a sex drive, having sexual function, um, having normal looking genitals, having normal working genitals. Um, Like I gave that all up. And so, and I didn't even know it at the time. Yeah, it's a lucrative process. Yeah. And so that's my biggest advice more than anything is that there's no need to rush. There is no need to rush this transition, no matter how much it feels like it. And I think that's a larger conversation about, I think, how we've created a culture that has led to that. Um, But regardless, even though it may feel like you need to transition as much as possible, as fast as possible, because you don't want to be mistreated, trust me, it's not worth it. Trust me, it is so not worth it. It's yeah. not worth your long-term health because it that will destroy mm-hmm. your mental health too. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm I I think that that's that's one of the most important things about your message is the fact that this is something that is so lucrative, so invasive. Seven hours is is just the you know, there's nothing else that can be said about that. It is seven hours. It doesn't get more lucrative than seven hours on an operating table, seven hours under anesthesia. That's like a lot. You're not supposed to be under that for so long. So that in itself should give people an accurate idea as to what this looks like and why it's important for you to be Mm-hmm. 18 years old minimum and I was talking to Jack about this last week and he said something that was really smart and makes sense and he said that we were both talking about the fact that at the end of the day when you're 18 you're an adult but even when you're 18 you're just coming out of high school you don't know about these things a lot of us LGBT people grow up being told that everybody fucking hates us because we're mm-hmm. LGBT and so right. you grow up already being like standoffish against yeah, people yeah. Right. And he he said that what we should be doing is, yes, at 18, you're allowed to start making the steps to transition, but you need two years of psychological evaluation, of going to therapy, of doing things before you can actually start, you know, going through surgeries. And and I think that's I right. I think it's the best way to go about yeah. it. It gives people an opportunity to to figure themselves out. 20 years old mm-hmm. is 
is, you know, it's a good place to start rather than 18, just coming out of high school. A lot of us, like you talking about earlier, the, you know, GSA and the Gay Straight Alliance clubs in school, like coming from being told that we're a minority and everybody hates us and we're a problem. It, it sounds like it would alleviate a lot of the concerns people have. Yeah, absolutely. That's my biggest, that's, I, that's something I am fully on board with as well, is that we need so m much more safeguards for transitioning. And that's not me saying that I think we need to take it away from people, that it doesn't work for some people, because it absolutely does. Absolutely does. And I'm happy I transitioned. However, we just need so much more safety in place for this process because it is not doing us any favors to not make sure that we're going through therapy. There is a reason why you talk to so many trans people and there is something that's happened. Right. Or even in, in the entire community, like lesbian, gay, bisexual, anything that that's very common in this community, that there are a lot, there's, there's a lot of mental health issues that go on and for a lot of different reasons. And so I think for somebody to want to medically transition, why would we not emphasize talking to them or giving them the respect, I feel like, to actually sit down and talk about it with them, ensure that every step throughout that process is doing the right thing for them and that it's working Absolutely. in the way it should and that their mental state is where it should be and that they're mentally healthy, not just and physically healthy as they go through that process. And that just wasn't there for me. And it's still not, still not. And it's not for so many people. They don't require that. They don't, they don't ask you to do that. Yeah. And that's so dangerous. I think for our, for, for the entire LGBT community safety, especially for their mental health. I don't, that is such a disservice to all of us to not do that. It is. And even now at 23, I still think about those traumatic experiences I had. I'm still thinking about them because I never addressed them because I just went after my body the whole time. I just felt like I need to keep fixing my body over and over again. And that's why, and that was in part because some of the messaging, like that right brain, wrong body sort of messaging when it comes to trans people. So I always just felt like my body is the reason why I'm not happy. And it's the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm feeling so negative. And it's the reason why I feel so negative about myself. When in reality, there's a lot of mental health issues that I probably have to do with that too. Mm -hmm. um, and not addressing those will only make them worse over time. And Absolutely. having that already there, plus the disaster of the surgery I went through made it really bad. And another thing I kind of just want to throw in there was that I also want us to be aware that if you do truly come to the conclusion that a surgical intervention is necessary, like especially a bottom surgery, because I mean, we've had, we have a lot more information and research on things like, like a nose or like a breast implants or stuff like that. But if you're going to go into bottom surgery, really take your time in that process, meet with multiple surgeons, really try and find as many stories, talk to as many, pe many people, like reach out to people. Um, and that was really why I felt motivated and why, honestly, I was like, you know what, maybe I will do the interview was because I think people really needed to hear a long form of what this looks like, because I could not find it when I was going through, when I was about to have this surgery. No one had ever sat down really and just sat and talked about it from beginning to where they were today of what it looks like, what everything that happened, what it looks like on the outside what it feels like, the complications, how they lived with it, what it was like through each, after three months, after six months. Like, it's so many just scattered little pieces of details. It's hard to even find pictures. Um, it's hard to find significant, like, data and information. And that's because it's not there. That's, that's because we don't have it. That's because there's barely any long-term studies of this, of this kind of stuff on trans people. Like, I had no idea until later research, um, just because more people spoke up and more information kind of was shown to me that the surgery I had, that specific technique was first done, um, and I think I've talked about it, it's for biological women that have genital deformities. Mm -hmm. And the first time it was done on a trans patient, like a, like a male, was 2017 in New York. And so that was only two years before I had it done. So... That's pretty wild yep. for me yep, to be able to have that, especially at my age. Um, it is, it is and so it'd be cool. so brand new. 
to to the even the trans world and for it to even be equated like it would go the same way as you do on a biological female when there's completely two different bodies going on there is it's it, it, you can't it's not a copy and paste it just doesn't work like that and mm-hmm. that's my biggest that's my biggest message more than anything is i'm never going to tell people how to go about transition or whether they should or should not because i don't i don't, i'm not in their mind and they're not in mine and More than anything, I just want people to be aware that there is a lot of conflicting information, even among surgeons that do this. For example, one of the things, and like this is something that Shape has talked about. um, One of the biggest clues that you could that you could see is that why is something like this procedure, like a bottom surgery, right, a male to female vaginoplasty, why is it that so many different surgeons have different have different schedules for dilating? What I mean by that is. For example, Dr. Roth told me like twice a day, 30 minutes each time. I've heard some doctors say once a day, 30 minutes. Some Mm. doctors say twice for an hour each time. Some doctors say one session an hour. That seems like something that we should have a consensus on for a complete reconstruction of your genitals. Why is it that every surgeon tells you to go about dilating differently? Yeah, especially when it's an important part of the process. Yeah, that's that should be a big red flag to all of us that there maybe isn't as as much widely accepted set in stone facts about this procedure yet. And that it is very much a wild card if you're going to undergo it and that a lot of things can happen. And so I just caution everybody more than anything to know that there is a lot that we just do not have the long-term information, the long-term studies, the long-term research yet. So just take it step by step and go, go as really take the time to reflect, go as slow as possible to protect yourself and your, your mental and physical health throughout the process of transitioning. Yeah. To safeguard your future, basically safeguard yourself for your future. It's, it has, effects that will precede you for the rest of your life. And one of the things that I want you to talk about is after all of these procedures, all of these doctor's visits, all of these procedures, can you, can you tell us what happened to your medical records? Yeah. So I kind of, after I lost contact with Dr. Roth, I just tried to move on with my life. Um, But that was pretty difficult because it was always there and I felt so isolated still because I don't, I don't, I'm like, how do I explore having a relationship or trying to, especially cause I was getting to an age where a lot of people were doing that. It's be, it's a part of that stage of life. And yeah. Intimacy. And I had never experienced it. And I already was struggling to have like sexual, like sex drive and sexual motivation. I even questioned if I was asexual for a long time. Because I was like, why do I not feel this? When in reality, it makes sense. Um, being on blockers and then hormones and stuff, like that's likely to happen. Um, but I, so I didn't really think, I tried not to think about it anymore, but it came to me that I was like, I want to try and see if there's any way to get justice for what happened. Like I just felt so neglected after the surgery and I was just wanted to see if there's any possibility to rectify this. Not that it could ever make it go away or it could be undone or that me even trying to see a case would fix it, but just for some sort of recognition that I shouldn't have been treated like this. Um, so I went to try and look at the medical records and I had no access to them online. Everything was taken off my like profile there and it was all gone. And so I was able to, fortunately, I started asking a lawyer and I sent in like a written request for everything they had under my name. And I mean, I asked for everything. I asked for all clinical summaries, discharge papers from the hospital, all clinician notes, um, notes from the nurses. I asked for imaging studies, blood tests, everything they had. And they were already pretty difficult with me. They made me fax over the request like four times, claiming they couldn't read it. 
um, even though one of them I typed on it. Um, and then, so they ended up receiving it. But then I also had someone from radiology called and they said, oh, we can't read the address. And like, it was a very, and I know that it's never an easy process to do any of this, but like, they were really giving me a hard time. Um, Right. And on top of that, they claimed to have sent it. Um, they, They claimed to have emailed me the documents and then I never had an email. And they were like, oh, it's showing here that we sent it like days ago. I look up and I'm like, there is not a single email, not in, it didn't go to spam because everything in spam you can see. Right. It's, there is no email from any of you. And it was the exact email. It was written, it was typed clearly on the thing. So there's no other email they could have sent it to. And it matched the email that's on even my, my profile on with the hospital. So there's nowhere else it could have went. Like where, where is it? And they so they were like okay well we'll send it again we'll send you an email again of all the all the documents we have they sent it to me and it's 42 pages right away i know that that's wrong because one i was in the hospital two weeks let alone all the appointments the pre-op appointment like there's no way it's just 40 how is it just 42 pages right And most of, and half of that was probably just lab results. And so the only notes that I had in there, there were no discharge papers from the hospital. There was no, no summary of me being in there each day for the two weeks. All that was in there was a summary of my initial, um, my initial consult with Dr. Roth. There was the actual day of surgery. There was. That was how I actually, I read about what they did while I was under anesthesia. That was where I actually got to read it. So that was in there, like a surgery, like a summary of the surgery. Um, There was, yeah, there was no discharge papers in there. And then it immediately jumped after that, like first day notes to a follow-up appointment after I had already been discharged. Hmm. I think that was the one where he had told me oh, you can still, like, have sex with it and try, like, using a pillow and stuff like that. It immediately jumps to that appointment. And then it jumps to my final appointment where I had the vaginoscopy. So it is missing so much. Like, I have no discharge papers, no day-to-day summary of when I was in the hospital. It's just It's just a bunch of fragments of everything that happened. And... When I asked them, I was like, where's the rest of it? They said, this is everything we have in your name. And so I still have no idea where all of that is um, or if it's just not under his name. And I'm also been have been made aware, but they didn't explicitly tell me this, but it's likely this could be the why. Is that um, I believe it's possible for a hospital not to hand over certain records if they believe that it is a it can be a threat to your personal safety or the doctor's personal safety so like dr ross and at the time i had requested it i believe the interview was up one of the interviews was up and so Hmm. the hospital and stuff was already aware by the time that they had ended up getting like the legal request for it dr ross and riley and iu were already online like reporting people on like twitter and blocking people if they had like mentioned my name and his name or if they had like tagged him and like mentioned my name people had sent me screenshots showing that they would be blocked by riley hospital and iu health um so they were everybody there was fully aware of like kind of what was going on and so I'm not, I can't, I'm not going to definitively say that's what they did. Like they didn't hand it over because they worried for his safety, but I can definitely say that they, they, for some reason are missing a majority of my medical records and have not handed them over. Right. Of Um, course. So I'm led to believe, of course, based off of everything that you're describing, I am led to believe by common sense, obviously that you gave yourself a sex change 
and you gave yourself um, injections to change your gender and to block your puberty. You did this to yourself and you started this at the age of 12 with your family. You guys are in a cult and this is just what you guys did. And and right. And that this is how you ended up being the way that you are today. It wasn't because the medical professional um, allegedly went above their oath and did something that they were not supposed to do. So I do want to ask you, and and I want to, I want to push away from these people that, you know, besides being alleged criminals, really mean nothing to the uh, trajectory of your future life. I I do want to ask you, what does moving forward look like for you after something like this? What what does a brighter future look like? Because I know there is one, but what what are you doing to make your future, you know? I mean, as a, I think that you should be a motivational speaker, but well, thank you. <laughs> what are you what are you planning for yourself? Yeah, so I think I'm still figuring that out. I this is all definitely very new to me. Kind of like moving on from it. Like I, it was kind of after that I got, actually got into modeling, and that was something I've done for a while. Um, I still do. I just did it. I just <laughs> did like a like three days ago. One of my favorite shoots of all time. Okay. Um, <laughs> and many more to come but it was something that definitely made me feel really confident and if i felt like i actually got to express myself in a way and i got to be seen in such a in such a cool way and i think a lot of people look at it and they're like they think it's like porn and i'm like it's that's you you guys do not understand the amount of time and effort put into those things and i am like it's truly art to me that I collaborate with with amazing people that I've mm-hmm. built up over the years, and that is one of the best ways of me to express myself and like a vision that I have in my brain, and I just kind of bring it to life with other people. And so and, you're using this as a career opportunity. You want to start yeah, modeling. So that's something I awesome. still will always do. Um, it was like I was doing it full time, which was kind of hell. I don't want to do that because then you okay. kind of have to do everything, even things <laughs> you don't want to do. Like yeah. You have to do every single opportunity you can. So I kind of like that I'm at, I'm at a point now where I kind of just pick and choose what I want to do. And so that's really nice. But I definitely had to work to get there. But I think when it comes to this kind of thing, I I never thought I would, like I, I kind of told you, I, I kind of just tried to ignore it for a while. But it it felt so inauthentic. And it wasn't that like, and I guess I did that because I wanted to just live my life and not always be that, be a trans person. Like I wanted to just be a person more than anything. I wanted people to know me for more than that. And since I was passing, I was able to, I was kind of able to do that. But living with what happened to me and kind of witnessing what I was seeing online and the news and media talking about trans kids and this and that, and I'm like, and like I started to see detransitioner stories, but I had never seen a story like this. Um, I think a lot of detransitioners we see are actually female to male. Um, and not a lot of them have, and it was all typically like a double mastectomy was like the surgery they had had. But I was like, I had never seen a story like mine or somebody mm-hmm. that had actually been through as much transition as I have like for a long time, like, I mean, like I said, I'm now on 10 years of transition and I'm only 23 and having multiple procedures and having a procedure go like this and the way it did. I just, I've never seen anybody sit down and actually give those details. And I think that those are details that people are kind of talking about in hypothetical. Like it's a lot of adults, like whether it be activists, like they're all typically adults advocating for children to have access to like all trend like medical services to transition and then you have the other side of it where it's just adults critiquing that kind of activism and pushing Mm -hmm. back and we're just seeing like (laughs) little bits of stories of kids popping up but I said I think I kind of have the opportunity here just to even kind of just share it in one way or another I didn't know if it was gonna be I didn't never I never thought it was gonna be an interview but just kind of tell somebody and so that was how I, I got in contact with, with Walt Heyer was because I just wanted to talk to him more than anything and actually just say it, what had happened. And, and just and, so that, just because I, we had that conversation off camera, um, he is, you know, oh. in relation to that organization you were telling me about that kind of got you in, in contact with Candace. Right. Yeah. So 
um, I reached out to Sex Change Regret, um, which is, I believe, an organization for detransitioners and kind of to help them um, throughout that process. But I wanted to reach out to him because detransitioners, I have a lot of empathy for them. And because they've also typically gone through some sort of medical practice that wasn't ideal. Right. And, and you were looking you were looking for a lawyer to possibly yeah, do a lawsuit. I was looking for legal advice. I was just looking for advice. And right. I was like, I've been trying to ignore this, but I just can't. It's still there and it hurts like inside. And I just don't feel like I'm being my full authentic self, like trying to pretend like this didn't happen. And so it was in the that exchange and like that was how I got connected to Candace because she's speaks about sex change regret a lot, Lynn Walt hire a lot and their friends. And that was how I got connected to her. That was what made me get connected to Buck. And that was just how now it's kind of where I'm at today. And I kind of just talk about all of it in general. It's just because I want to live my life like authentically and I want to use something that happened to me, not even to dictate what other people do, but just to give people more information that I think that they deserve. You want to live your truth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I want people to be as informed as possible if they're going to go down this this path and go through a transition, whether it be going through a surgery or going through hormones. I want to give all the details that I have, because like I said, this has been 10 years of my life. I've seen a lot in a gender clinic. I've I've seen a lot in terms of having surgeries. I've seen a lot of gender doctors, um, especially because all the, the doctors in the clinic are like big advocates. Dr. Roth is a huge activist um for childhood transition services and so like i've witnessed a lot of things in that process um especially before this was even a big conversation in the news like i saw it i saw how the gender clinic was when no one's eyes were on it um and so i just felt like it was so valuable for even people to just hear those details not for me to tell them what to do or how to live their life but just just to have those details I think people have always wanted to hear. Yeah, people need to know the story. And that's why, that's why you know, before we even press record, you and I had the talk about the fact that I this is going to be a long interview. It's going to be a full in-depth conversation about your entire story because of the fact that we both agree that it's very important that people know this story and, and people know not just your story, but also the story of the criminals, the alleged criminals and their malpractice, because they're, they're really, they're the villains in this conversation. So it's important that people are aware and that people are aware by name of who mm -hmm. these people are, because Dr. Gallagher is on TikTok, just living it up, doing cute little like edit videos so people need to know this. People need to know this. But I, I really want to I want to end on a, a lighter note. I, I do want to ask you, you know, what is your relationship like with your family now? Is, is are things better? It sounds like you you've kind of reached a spot where, you know, things are things are going well in your family life. Yeah, it's OK. Um, so luckily, it's amazing with my mom and my stepdad, my mom has been the only person that's been in my life since day one. Um, so she's invaluable to me. She Absolutely. is my role model and I wouldn't be here today without her being there for me. Um, and she's actually been my biggest supporter in talking about this. I wouldn't have ever been able to sit with Candace without my mom, like helping me and supporting me to do it. Um, or I would have never even spoken a word about this if she, she always believed that I would be that I would be a good person to talk about it. Um, she always believed that I had such a valuable perspective and story, but I just didn't I didn't even want to think about it. I mm -hmm. wanted to pretend it wasn't real. But when I finally did, she was all she was all in and she was always behind me. Um, and she is, still is now. And same with my stepdad. My stepdad is I'm so grateful that he's kind of like like a real father to me. That's um, awesome. Yeah. I'm glad. And even though it's it's hard because he just came into my life when I was older. So obviously it's different, but in that time he's made up for everything. He's he's mm -hmm. I don't think of him in any other way. And so luckily that that's what matters to me more than anything, even though still don't have much relationship. 
at all really with my dad um and with your biological father yeah um, well you know what let me tell you something it's it's uh I've, I've learned this in my life a very long time ago it's about those who count not those that you can count right, right. so absolutely i'm you know i i am so proud of you so proud of you for for just not just for for telling your story and for surviving your story i'm just proud of you because it takes a lot as a human being to be so vulnerable and you know we live in a time in society where vulnerability and people speaking about things that are important are not appreciated they're very much undervalued mm -hmm. so you know being given the opportunity to sit here and have a long form conversation with you and and being given the opportunity to share this story with people i am more than grateful and i can tell you that you know god has dealt you an interesting deck of cards i'll tell you that you've been dealt an interesting deck of cards like is given to all of us we just all have the different shuffle right. but mm -hmm. but i i genuinely believe that it's people like you and big mouth bitches like me okay. that <laughs> that are going to start changing things and you know we we have some new sheriffs in town things are going to oh, yeah things are going to change i just yeah. want to ask you is there anything else that you want to say before we sign off yeah i think really all i want to say is that me talking about this is not inherently me stating a political belief i want to make that clear Absolutely. Because I think a lot of people have been like, why are you not detransitioning? Why do you not think this and this? And that's, this is way too complex to do this. This is beyond politics. And I think that's the last thing I really want to say here is mm -hmm. that we are trying to force the entire issue of people being trans, what being trans is when, when people transition into a political debate. This is so much bigger than that. And I, and I truly wish that my story would have illuminated that when in reality, I think for a lot of people, it kind of just emboldened them in their belief. And so I felt a little bit like the story kind of took on a life of its own for a lot of people. Um, but I want to make that very clear one more time that we need to put that aside a little bit. This is too complex for us to start to just have a debate over. I've noticed now it's kind of like mm -hmm. either everybody's all in, everybody needs to be able to transition, kids need to be able to transition. And then you have the other side that like, it's like abolish it all. I've seen it kind of lean towards that recently. And keep in mind, we're still talking about real people. Right. Of we're course. We're still talking about a group of people that is so mentally vulnerable, that is still, even just the LGBT community in general, so prone to mental health struggles, a lot of adverse experiences in their childhood we're losing our humanity in this conversation you can even see it in the comments of the interviews i've done um yep. look at some of the very degrading comments made um i encourage people to actually read that i really do um because i actually went in there with no agenda i went into them i'm not here to push a political belief i just wanted to hear tell a story and i want you to look at how, i want people to look at some of those things yeah. And look at how many people do not care. And we have now created an environment where we are we are looking at trans people a little bit dehumanizing. Um and we're losing like basic respect for human beings. And I want us to remember that yeah, we all have our beliefs and we all go about things in a different way. We all look at look at the same issue differently. Absolutely. But please let's not forget our humanity regardless of whatever opinion you hold or whatever side of it you're on. Yeah. And I think that's all around. I think that's regardless of trans, regardless of black or white, regardless yeah. of gay or straight. I think that, you know, we're, we're all losing the human aspect of Seriously. doing what you and I are doing right now and yeah. sitting down to talk and, you know, ha having a conversation about things that, that do matter, you know? And, and I think that, above anything else, I think it's so important that you highlight how apolitical this is and how this mm -hmm. really doesn't have a left or a right. Yeah. Just so that you guys are aware, you know, whatever whatever we say at the end of the day doesn't matter because people are going to chop this up and get their own opinion. But keep in mind how unpolitical this is. Yeah. Rihanna lives in a red state. 
Mm -hmm. So this happened under Republican laws. So this has nothing to do with Democrat, Republican, because if it can happen in a red state, it's happening in a blue state. It's happening in every state, which is why it's important that we sit here and highlight stories like this, because, you know, there, there, there really is not a conversation like this that is so long and so in-depth talking about it. There isn't. There really isn't. There really is not. And it's, it's so, so important that we, we highlight the conversation in its entirety, not just yeah. in an hour and a half conversation, but okay. <laughs> so that was, that was quite a, quite a lot. I think that we pretty much touched on everything that we were supposed good. to touch on today. So okay, that's awesome. Um, I do want to go ahead and say you guys, that is obviously going to be the end of the conversation. I'm pretty sure that some of you are aware, as I'm not surprised if you're going to be jumping off from Brianna's channel to come to mine in a little bit once this is posted. But keep in mind that Brianna does have a YouTube channel in case you are not aware. So go over there, subscribe, leave some likes, watch some videos. You did a video on autogynophilia really recently, and it was really good. So I you highly recommend that you watch that. It was Thank amazing. Just, let me say that has been the video <laughs> that, um, ooh, like... Lots of people really mad about it. Um, yeah, it and, was amazing. You know, I've had some very fair criticism, but it wasn't helped by the fact that there was a live Twitch reaction to it from a YouTuber, and it was basically, and I'll and I'll acknowledge this because I haven't acknowledged it <laughs> yet. I'll acknowledge it here. All I want to say is there was wonderful valid criticism there, and I did listen to it and I actually really took into consideration some of the things said there that actually will help me when I approach a subject um and also will get me to reflect and honestly it's going to help me like understand the issue more however I am disappointed in the fact that this person allowed their audience to end themselves they within before they even press play on the video they looked at my appearance and they said that I, I they can tell I'm going to be a catty, like stuck up mean girl who's going to bully trans people that I think are ugly. Mm. And they, by setting that premise, you've let your audience attack me um, and continue that sort of messaging. And basically these are other trans people that are basically attacking me calling me plastic like all kinds of different insults right right because you're pretty and, <laughs> and, and apparently that's a crime <laughs> and, like oh my god pretty girl let's bully her no <laughs> but but i bring that up though just because i when did i talk about those people's appearances in the video not once yeah because it's irrelevant it's irrelevant yeah. it's, it's just jealousy at hand it's just and jealousy so, i'm just disappointed though that like you your valid critique got buried underneath personal assumptions and dislike for my appearance because you don't like that I look a certain way and you believe that that makes me act a certain way. Right. Um, when I've made it pretty clear that part of my messaging and why I'm telling people to slow down their transition because passing is not worth their health. But yet you looked at me and you made an assumption that because I pass, I think that everybody else that doesn't is beneath me. And then you also made the assumption that I think that if you don't have dysphoria with your genitals, then you're not really trans, when that's like completely against the message I've been spreading this whole time. So I just, I wanted to bring that up though, because that just shows you on the trans side of things. Like, I think we also have a lot of work to do with each other. And yeah, so I, I wanted to address that because I hadn't addressed that because a lot of people, a lot of people got upset about that video. And I understand some valid critique, but a lot of it has been fueled by certain people that have kind of put out certain messages about me in relation to that video. So I wanted to make that clear that you guys are kind of fucked up too. So, <laughs> yeah, it's not just me, yeah. you guys too, because you guys are claiming that like, oh, because I look a certain way, this, you guys are the ones that said that they were ugly yeah they're picking you for your looks yeah they they literally said oh she's picking on trans people that are ugly yeah but that just mind you i never said ugly 
That just goes back to jealousy. That's what, you know, know. It, it goes back to our conversation that we were having just a moment ago about dehumanizing people for not agreeing yeah. with you on certain things. Um, because of the fact that, you know, and people are going to get mad at me for mentioning it because of the fact that you do pass, you do look female. Um, because of that reason, the people that are, you know, the men in wigs with the hairy chest that we talk about, those people, those are the people that are like, oh, this pretty girl gets a chance to go on Candace Owens and talk about being trans and oh my God. And it's going to happen. And I told you this through text. You know, you're that bitch when you cause all this conversation. conversation. Like, so and keep it cute, girl. Keep it cute. <laughs> real cute. Got bodyguards waiting outside. Keep, your, keep it cute, girl. Here. Keep it real cute. <laughs> so keep it real cute <laughs> but like and also like it just shows you like we need to let this passing shit go can we please i'm begging like this has this is a plague to fucking trans people like on both sides of it on both sides of it because even the conservative like the, like it's so funny that they claim i'm a pick me for conservatives when they have been shitting on me since i was on candace's set yeah like, there are a lot of conservatives that have, do not care what I have to say. It doesn't matter how conservative some of my beliefs are. They don't care. Right, and I'm well aware not, of that. And they shit on me regardless. It's not one size fits all. So, and it's not like you guys are picking me either. So this is like the most anti-pick me shit ever. Like, it really is. Because you're criticizing something that you either have to fully love or fully hate. Yeah, that's how you know that you're and in we're, And I'm actually picking it apart. I'm picking it actually apart. Right. And giving an in-depth look in certain things. And that's how you know that you're in a cult. And that's how you know that right. it is a cult. So no wonder you guys are all upset. <laughs> right, exactly. No wonder they're all upset. Because when you start calling out Jim Jones, he gets a little bit defensive. Mm -hmm. But on that note, we're going to go ahead and end it there. It has been a long enough conversation. Right. Oh, my God. Right. Like I said, go ahead and check out Brianna's channel. I'll talk to you guys in a second to close things off. But... Again, thank you, Brianna, for coming on and just being so vulnerable with me. Uh, I know that a lot of people are going to appreciate this conversation for for what it is. Um, I don't. I think that you know people can give a shit for maybe the things that we say, the opinions that we have, but nobody can give you shit for telling your story. So again, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. That was quite the story. Again, thank you so much to Brianna for lending me her time. If you haven't already, like, comment, and subscribe. Let me know what you thought of this video. Feel free to watch the first episode in the series as well. There will be a playlist coming shortly. Just give me an opportunity to do a few more interviews. Who should I have an honest conversation with next? Shall it be you? Feel free to message me through DM at any of my socials, or you can always just go ahead and use the email that is on screen and in the description of every video. I'll see you on the next one.